Good morning. So good to see you all. My name is Matt, and I serve as one of the pastors here. Uh, good to be with you this morning. Again, special greeting to those of you who are with us for the very first time. We consider it such a privilege to have you here with us this morning. Uh, and how great is it to sing about a love that just never, never runs out. So, so beautiful. So thank you, Jason, and the, the team for that. Uh, before we get started, I want to let you know, two weeks from this morning, we will be starting a new series. Pastor Conda will be launching a new series called Decisions, Decisions, Knowing the Will of God. And uh, that's going to start on August 27th, and, and we're just so excited about diving into uh, this conversation and just some of the challenges that can come from knowing as we are uh, just trying to chart some of the course of our life. How do we get in lockstep and on the same page with God and the will that he has uh, for us? And so wanted to let you know about that, uh, especially because a new series is just a great time to invite uh, some friends and family to, to join in, maybe visit church uh, for the first time, especially as we enter into this fall season when uh, people are just kind of starting the, the rhythms of fall. A lot of people will enter back into church or maybe try church for the first time. So as you can see on this graphic right above me, there's a phone number. If you text uh, the word decisions, you don't have to capitalize or anything, just the word decisions to this number, it will send you a link that will send you a graphic that you can download to your personal device. You can use that graphic on social media or you can text it out to friends and family to help you in inviting them uh, to this series. So would love for you and friends and family to join us for that on the 27th. But today you are joining us for, uh, we are in the middle of a series that we are calling But First. Being busy better. But first, being busy better. And that's a mouthful, and I was really concerned about getting that out and not tripping over myself. But the reality of this, what we're talking about, is that summer is almost over, right? And, and, and vacations are over. Uh, my family, we went on uh, our vacation just this past week, and so we, we got back and got in the swing of things yesterday. And, and so, you know, we're just kind of lamenting that moment of like, oh, it's, it's, it's over. And, and for a few days, for many of us, our kids will uh, start into school. And so there's all the craziness that comes with that. And, and for some parts of us in this room, we are just thrilled that school has started. For other parts in the room, we're a little sad. And hey, there's no judgment. This is a safe place, however you're falling on that spectrum. No problem on that. Uh, for some of you, uh, I see we have some of our college students back in the house. Good to have you all back with us this morning. Yes. I know they are, they are starting the return over these next couple of weeks, and, and you all are going to be uh, suffering from that syllabus shock moment here in, in just a couple of weeks. And that's just the reality of, of what happens. Projects picks up, sports picks up, clubs pick up, and that's just the rhythm of the fall. Because summer, summer's a little bit more relaxed, right? It's a, it's a little bit more chill, kind of has its own sort of vibe and rhythm to it where, hey, you know what? Stay up a little bit later, sleep in a little bit longer, go on those vacations, just, you know, have a good time connecting with people and traveling and all those sort of things. Just kind of fly by the seat of your pants maybe a little bit. But the fall, the fall can come at you and just sort of just kind of hit you right in the face with sort of a different sort of rhythm and cadence, kind of like a marine drill sergeant that's like, hey, drop and give me 20. And yes, sir, may I have another? I mean, it just kind of has that like, and it can catch you off guard. And so that's why we want to talk about being busy better, because the reality is in this season, in this fall season, we can all find ourselves being defined by that one word, busy. And in some ways, that, that can have some real negative connotations, but in other ways, it can be positive, and some of it just depends on how prepared you are for it. A, a number of years ago, um, I had the, the privilege of working the water ski and wakeboard championships uh, for a couple of years down in Callaway Gardens, which is just south of Atlanta, uh, for the Outdoor Living Network, and, and it was just such a blast. It was one of my favorite events to, to be a part of um, for a couple of years, uh, because I as I saw it, it was like just being around these magicians on water. I mean, they did the most unbelievable things, you know, wakeboard and skis. I mean, these tricks and flips and spins and, and all kinds of stuff. And, and, you know, going fast and it was crazy and it was just awesome. And I don't know if you've ever seen these, these high speed, uh, long distance ski jumpers. 
It's really similar to what you see in the Winter Olympics, you know, where they go down the, the ramp thing and they, they, they lean forward and they just kind of glide as far as they can. Well, same thing except it's on water and they're being pulled by a rope and, and this boat is just dragging them across the lake and phew, shooting them off a ramp and they have to land on water. And it's, it's just crazy. And when it comes together, when it all happens the way it's supposed to happen, it's just this beautiful, just unbelievable thing where you have this skier and these huge skis and, you know, they're holding this rope and, and the boat kind of goes around the lake and picks up a little momentum. And then right as it comes across the ramp, the boat does this sort of S curve where it just cuts across the front of the ramp and does this whiplash effect to send the skier off the ramp at over 70 miles an hour and sends them more than 240 feet through the air where they have to make this landing. And when they land it, it is just awesome and they're standing ovations and it's just the most beautiful thing. But every now and then, it doesn't quite come together the way it's supposed to. And in the few years that I was kind of around this event, I saw a few of those moments where for whatever reason, you know, the, the, the transfer with the boat in front of the ramp wasn't just perfectly the way it needed to be, or the rope got just a little bit tangled, or the skier maybe went off the ramp a little bit too fast or just a little bit sideways. And oh my goodness, it was just yard sale on the lake. I mean, just crash and like skis and things and ropes and everything's flying everywhere. And it just kind of has that moment where the crowd's like, <gasps> and fortunately, I never saw anyone get, get seriously hurt, but I definitely saw just some unbelievable wipeouts. And this is just some of the reality of what it's like when we are busy and our lives are very full. There, there's some ways that it can happen where it can just be beautiful and perfect rhythm and sync, just like the boat as it crosses across the ramp and just whips the skier in the air. You can just be planned and thought out and well just prepared for your fall and for the season and for the coming year. And you can glide through the air and people are just like, oh, that's so beautiful. It's amazing. Look at that person. I just wish I could be more like them. Oh, they landed. It was awesome. And then there's others of us and other times where we get a little tangled up in our rope and, you know, we kind of get drug around the lake a little bit and maybe we go off the ramp sideways and we, we hit the water and everybody's like, oh man, that's going to leave a mark. And like, that's just so, that's just so sad and that, that's so hard. And so that's why we want to talk about being busy because as a church we say, hey, great. We're not surprised by busy. And in fact, we're planning on busy. We, we want to own what it looks like to be busy. And for those of you who are just catching up with us, this, this graphic above me, um, the, the rocks and the sand and, and the jar, it's based on this illustration that I'm sure many of you have heard, the, the college professor who comes into his class and basically gives a challenge to his students of, hey, I have these big rocks and these pebbles and this sand and this jar, and I want you to figure out how to fit it all in. And the students kind of wrestle and they struggle through this exercise, and, and they find that if they put the sand and the pebbles in there's just not room to, to put the big rocks in. But the group figures out that the ones that can put the big rocks in first, then, then there's room to drop in the pebbles around it. And then finally there's room to pour the sand around it. And there's a way to fit it all in. And, and the, the, the value of, of that lesson, and we know this, is that the big rocks in our life have to go first. If we aren't planning on those, if we aren't giving margin for those, there's no way that they're going to fit in. And what we're kind of saying unapologetically as a church is that we believe the church is one of the big rocks of our life. It's, it's one of the big rocks that deserves to be put in the jar first. Because as we've discussed the church is, is something that Jesus was all about. His agenda centered around the church. His affections were poured out towards the church. His pursuit was about his bride, the church. Something that he found worthy to give his life, to, to come from heaven, to live his life here on earth, to, to give that life up, to die for his bride. And so we feel like if, if this is something that Jesus felt was worth giving his life to, it's certainly something that we should have a priority and something that should show up on our radar in a pretty big way. And, and just so you hear us really clearly, we, we aren't so bold to say that life at Mission Point is the big rock as much as life and connecting and rooting yourself in a local church 
is a big rock. So if you don't connect here, if you don't find some of the things that we talk about to, to, to spur you on and to move you towards a sense of belonging and, and action, then, then we would encourage you to, to please connect somewhere that you do. But in this, we are going after and seeking what it is that Jesus cares about so deeply. And in that, we want to just bring on the fall and all the busyness that comes with it. But first, we want to prioritize what he was willing to give his life for. So for us at Mission Point, we've identified four pillars of what it means to be involved around here. So if you consider Mission Point your church home, these four pillars are for you. First is your skills and service. Your skills and service. And you hear us talk about this a lot. You just heard Emily mention this. We're in that season of just uh, looking for people to connect with some of our teams and to volunteer and to use your gifts and your talents and the things that God has given you to invest and to make a difference in the lives of others around here. Skills and service. The second is stuff and generosity. Stuff and generosity. This condo talked about this last week. Giving of your stuff. Giving of your resource resources, having a hilarious generosity, just giving with this gladness and this joy. Self and community, this, this thought of are we taking steps towards connecting deeper in community in more meaningful ways? And then finally, our story and outreach. Are we sharing our story of life change and his story of redemption to the world around us? Skills and service, stuff and generosity, self and community, story and and outreach. These are four pillars that we talk about and we will talk about often around here as things that we value as we consider these big rocks to be intentional about. And so today we want to talk about community. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews is in the New Testament towards the end of your Bible. And if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the scripture on the screen. And if you don't own a Bible, we would love to, to give one to you and you can get one at the Connection corner on your way out today just let them know you would like a bible and we'll gladly hand one to you hebrews chapter 10 starting in verse 24 and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, for those of you who grew up in the church like me, you may have heard this verse at some point, or maybe several points, quoted as sort of the verse um, to, to maybe guilt you into showing up to church every single week, you know, because, hey, don't uh, give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, uh, you know, hey, duels, it's good to see you back at church today. And it's like, man, we just went on vacation. Like, that's super rude. Chill out. And yet there was just kind of this verse that maybe the pastor would use, like, you know, don't give up meeting together. You got you to gotta come, you know, <clears throat> you know and, and just kind of pound that in, and you're going to love this because today I'm, I'm going to let you off of the hook on, on this one. And so, so after lunch today, you can look up your old childhood pastor and, and give him a call or shoot him an email and just say, hey, pastor, you're not going to believe it. My pastor today told me that, you know, all those years ago when you talked about Hebrews 10 and, and you know, life and coming to church and, you know, you, you were wrong about that, that verse and, and um, you, you weren't right. And, you know, and then he taught us what it really means and, and used it to guilt us and assign it for small groups. So we learned that it was just a different thing altogether. So just wanted to let you know that. No, seriously, um, we want to look at this and we want to consider what this verse does mean for us today. Let's consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Now, earlier, Emily, had you stand and, and greet people around you and, and say hi. And, and I, I know for some of us, that, that's always just that awkward, you know, hard, tense moment of like, oh, man, standing up, talking to people. Oh, oh good. I've got somebody next to me that I know. Like, hey, how's it going? And then like the super aggressive person behind you is like, hi, how's it going? And you're like, I don't know you. It's awkward. And it's hard. Now, imagine this. Imagine if she had, you know, said, hey, I want you to stand and greet each other. And I'd love for you just to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. You'd be like, What? I don't even know what that look. Hi, I'm, I'm Matt, and um, just, man, go out and love some people and <laughs> do some good deeds. I don't know what to do with this. This is, this is too awkward. And, and, and that's just 
the reality for us. See, for the first century Christians and the ways that they lived and the ways that they were in community, this would have had a little bit of a different meaning and application than what it means to us today in our modern Western church. And see, we have to be honest about this gathering that we find ourselves in. It's awesome. I mean, we, we love it. Do not get me wrong. There's a number of us who have given our, our lives to it, and we, and we, we are full-time in on, on what it means to uh, just work and, and, and work hard towards building this place up and helping to create environments for people to meaningly come and worship and, and connect with Jesus and we do that each week and we consider it a privilege. And if you've been around here for any length of time, you've heard me pray um, as, as we've started church or, you know, at different times. Um, Father, thank you for the privilege it is to be here together because it is. It's an absolute beautiful privilege to come here and to worship Jesus together. And there are brothers and sisters of ours around the globe who would just absolutely love to have this sort of freedom and opportunity to come in with a community of people. And we get to step out of our busy, hectic, distracted, sometimes often weighty lives and the tough weeks that we may have had. And we get to come in here for a little more than an hour and corporately just turn our hearts and our affections towards God and raise our voices and sing songs like we just sang and just incredible lyrics like, Higher than the mountains that I face, stronger than the power of the grave, constant through the trial and the change, one thing remains. Your love never fails, never gives up, it never runs out on me. And we get to sit in this reminder, in this recentering, this refreshing of who God is and his character and who Jesus is and his love and his grace being poured out for us our place in the story and we get to bring in some of the burdens and some of the things we've been carrying and just just place it at his feet and corporately we sing together and corporately we we take our offering and and we give back we acknowledge that everything god has given us belongs to him to start with And, and so we return and invest back into his kingdom work through our offering together and and then we open God's word and we listen and we invite the spirit to speak and to, to change us and to move us and to draw us closer to Jesus in some way. And all of that is great. And we work really hard to make this the most effective, engaging, welcoming environment it can possibly be. And we pray and we beg God that he would just get us out of the way and do the work that only he can do in an environment like this so that he may be glorified and that our lives may be changed. But when it comes to this idea of spurring one another on, spurring one another on, encouraging one another in love and good deeds, that should not be mistaken for what's happening right now here in this room. It's not one person standing on a stage speaking to everyone. See, I believe what that passage is saying is Hebrews is about Everyone being present and being together and being known and being active in this relational pursuit of doing life together. And in a church our size, we believe that happens most effectively in small groups, in smaller communities. My my former pastor said and continues to say, life change happens best in circles not in rows. And as a leadership team, we believe that. This idea of spurring one another on, encouraging one another towards love and good deeds, that happens best in the context of smaller communities, of sitting in circles, of being eyeball to eyeball and having the opportunity to get to know each other and connect with each other in a powerful way. It's more effective and what it means to, to grow and to be discipled than, than what we can do in here. And I can prove that to you. When you come in here week in and week out, you guys are awesome. You, you, you smile. A lot of you come in your, your, your Sunday best and, and you, you come through the doors and you're excited to be here and you lift your voices and, and you sing loud and you connect with people and you respond to things and you, you talk. He's like, hey, how you doing? I'm good, I'm good. But the reality is, and you, and you know this, 
you, you may have woken up at your house and, and it may have been more of like a five alarm fire drill to, to get out the door. I mean, there, there, there may have been some crying, there may have been some screaming, um, maybe a little bit of yelling, maybe some talking about God in like not holy ways. Um, you know, things that maybe you possibly regret. And, you know, the, the whole ride here was super tense. And you're, like, making threats under your breath, like, the entire way through the parking lot. Like, if you just scream one more time, you'll never see that fidget spinner again. So help me, I'm telling you. And then you see the greeter, and it's, like, Instagram ready. Oh, hi, good morning. It's so good to see you. Oh, good morning. Oh, good to see you, too. How are you doing? Oh, I'm so good. The kids are good. They're good. They're so good. They're so good. Yes, we're all good. And I can say that because pastors are the worst at that. Seriously, we're the worst at this because it's, it's kind of our job to keep it all together, right? Like, like that's kind of the unspoken agreement that, that we sort of have with each other in this, this arrangement. This past week, as I said, uh, we, we went on um, a vacation up to, to Silver Beach to just do a getaway with our kids before school starts up, and um, it, was, it was great and just such a fun time. And so we're out on Silver Beach, and in the middle of just a few thousand people, Mary Shindell, who's just one of the kindest, sweetest people that you're ever going to meet, she she's, attends here at Mission Point, her and her family, spots Caleb and, and just kind of weaves her way through the crowd and comes up and says, hi, and it was great, and we talked for a minute, and hey, how's it going, and, and you know, then she went on her way, and we sat back down, and it was great, and yet in the back of my mind, I'm just like, Jesus, thank you that she did not run into us in the parking lot 15 minutes ago, because the wheels on the bus had fallen off. I mean... <laughs> I was raining down threats on my children. Like, it was just like, you know, the whole, like, we're going to turn the van around. Like, this trip is over. You don't turn the attitude to gratitude. Like, this is done. I mean, it was like, it was getting just, you know, kind of ugly. And so I'm just like, just super, just stressed over like, oh my gosh, like, what if she'd seen that? And, and just, you know, our kids not being perfect and, and me kind of being a jerk. And, and then I'm like, I don't think I've showered in like four days. Like, I probably... <laughs> No, so Mary, I'm sorry if you're here. I really apologize for that, but it was, it was super good to see you. But, and that's so ridiculous, but we all do that to some degree, right? We're, we're so afraid that if we say the wrong thing or, or we do the wrong thing in these brief moments and interactions with each other, that we'll just leave this impression of like, oh my goodness, what will they think of me? And, and ah, that, that was awkward and that was hard. And we just try to keep our Facebook, Instagram personas up for fear of what may happen if people actually saw behind the scenes. But you see, in smaller community, you get the opportunity to be known. And over the course of time, walls can begin to come down and you can find safety in these circles in ways that you never will in a row. Romans chapter 15, verse 7 says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. You see, being in smaller communities affords us the chance to really begin to get to know each other. And to hear one another's stories. And, and begin to let those walls down. And, and begin to just get a little bit more authentic. And a little bit more raw. And then we have those priceless moments. Where we hear those two words. That just can mean everything. When, when you take a choice and you, and you make a choice and you take a little bit of a risk. And you get out there with your story and some of the circumstances and things that are going on and you sort of tense up as you let it out and then you hear me too me too the person across from you me too maybe a couple of you around me too like whoa wait 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 what I'm not the only person that feels this way I'm not the only person that, that struggles with this Oh, man, me too. I totally know what that feels like. I just went through that. I'm going through that right now. 
And in those moments, we begin to build a confidence of what it means to let ourselves be known and to pursue what it means to really truly know others. And we begin that beautiful work of accepting one another just as Christ accepted us. And it's this incredible thing because see, when it comes to Jesus and his acceptance of us, see, his acceptance is, is wide open. He died for us while we were yet sinners. He didn't uh, require us to clean up our act to come to him. He says, no, come to me as you are. I accept you as you are, but I love you too much to leave you there. And, and you see, we take his lead in that in the context of healthy community and, and we begin to open up our acceptance of each other just as Christ accepted us, but we begin to build a vision for one another of what it means to not leave each other there. And our heart and our care for each other begins to spur one another on to love and good deeds. And through that, it brings praise to God. It's a way of worship. It's a way of glorifying Him. And it's something beautiful that happens so powerfully in the context of circles. Psalm 133, 1. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Or in community. Common unity. How good and pleasant it is. And scripture repeats this idea over and over and over again. This idea of unity and growth and health and life as the body of Christ. is found again and again and again. And it's this sign, it's this this marker that we're taking steps towards what it means to truly become followers and disciples of Jesus Christ. And, And as a leadership team and as an elder board, we know that that can only happen to a certain degree in here. And to fully lean into what it means to be making disciples, fulfilling the Great Commission... See, Matthew 22, when when they came to Jesus and said, what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God. Love others. Everything, law and prophets, they hang on that. And then later, a few chapters later, Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Go therefore into all the world, making disciples, baptizing them in my name. That's the command. That's the mission. That's what we're doing. And we exist to invite everyone everywhere to life in Christ. And all of that is about those two things, to lead people towards loving God and to love others and to make disciples. And what we know and what we believe is that that happens in the context of community. And yet in that, we are absolutely, fully, completely aware that we're making a really big, audacious request of you. So you you may be sitting here thinking like, okay, okay. So what you're saying, Matt, is I can come into this this place, this this building, this fairly large building, um, you know, slip into this dark room with with a fair amount of anonymity and uh, get my worship on and it's good and, and, you know, get a little, little word and that's awesome and I can slip out of here. And that's fine. And, and, and I love that. And, and I, I come every week. I, I don't give up the habit of meeting together. Just, you know, I, I'm good at that. But what you're asking me to do is you're asking me to go from, from that, from this, this environment, all the way across the spectrum into some stranger's living room with other strangers and possibly people I don't know and start to share about my life. Man, where is Kondo at? I really liked it better when he talked about generosity. Like, that was a much better sermon. Can we bring him back out? Because I, like, how much hilarious generosity will it take to get this idiot to stop talking about community? Because it's making me really uncomfortable. I'll pull out my checkbook right now. Like, seriously, that would be, that would be great. And listen, I get that. I get it. It's a really big, hard request. And we have a range of personalities 
in this room. Some of you with people are, are like a, a golden retriever to a, a tennis ball. It's just like you see people and you're like, people, people, I love people. Oh my gosh, people. Hi, it's so good to see you. Oh, I love when we stand up and greet each other. And I can't wait till he's done talking because then I'll get to talk to more people and sign up for small groups. I'd love to sign up for small groups. There's seven days in a week. Can I sign up for seven of those things? Because that'd be great. I actually have time on Monday morning. I do Monday morning too. Like, oh, I love people. And some of us look at you like, I just don't even understand. Like, it's just, what's wrong with you? But you love people. And others of us ha have this sort of vibe of like, listen, people, it's fine. I'm okay with, with people, but I'm good with my people. I want, I want my people, my crew, I, you know, my, my family, my crew, you know, put me in with strangers. Like, uh-uh, no, thank you. Get me with my people. Like, that's, a, that's okay. That's, that's okay. And then others of us are just like, I got to be honest with you. People are super annoying. I don't like people. I just, I just don't. What I like is getting things done. And people feel like a waste of time, and they're kind of messy, and they're a little bit crazy, and it just gets hard dealing with people. And pastors up here talking about, you know, this busy fall, and it's kind of stressing me out because I feel like I really need to get out of here and organize and get some things done and just giving my life to people. Like, what? And I get that. And that's why we have teams of people who work really, really hard to design things and to set up things to help you take steps towards connection in community, no matter where you are. In fact, some of those of you who appreciate detail and organization, you, you'll appreciate some of the developed steps that we have in connection. And that's called our Connection 101, 201, and, and 301. And I want to just go through these kind of quickly and let you know a little bit of the structure and intentionality behind them, and then even a little bit of some of the offerings of things that are coming up. So you can begin to think about some of these things. The first one for us is the 101. It's, it's the contact event. When it comes to Connection, 101 is the contact event. It's super low commitment. This morning is a 101. What we're doing here right now is a 101. You just come, you show up, maybe you meet a couple people, you're, you're here for a, a little bit, a few moments, and then, then you, you head out. So hey, congratulations, you've already checked off one of the 101s. That's really, really good. You've already made a step. Another 101 is an environment that we call Next Steps. That's for those of you who are a little bit newer around here, and you want to find out a little bit more about the church and how to connect some of the history. It's a 15, 20-minute environment that we offer uh, some of the Sundays after church, and we let you know when that's happening. That's a great one-on-one -on -one environment because, again, you get to go meet a few people from our team, find out a little bit more about the church, and just learn, like, what does it mean to connect? Love Ops is another one-on-one -on -one for us because it's, it's our operation, our opportunity to take the love of Jesus out into the community. But for most of those things, it's just a one-time thing. It's, it's, it's like a three-hour, two-hour, three-hour just shift that you check in at an event, at, at, at uh, an environment, and, and you just give of yourself and your, your time and your service, and you connect with a few people along the way, and, and then you go home. And, and those are great things to do, and those are great ways for you to sort of stick your feet into the shallow end of the pool and what it means to begin to connect. And then we have 201, which is our connection level, 201, and that would be uh, our volunteer teams. Again, when we talk about skills and service and we say, hey, we need some people to help out, um, you know, with our tech team or the parking crew or the greeters and, you know, the variety of things, some of the children's ministry roles. And, and those, those are some of the areas where we say, hey, it's a little bit more of a commitment. For some of you, it's, it's serving once a month. Some of it's several times a month. But it puts you in a, a context where you get to be with a team of people. and Maybe you connect with the same people a little bit more often. Another area in our 201 is our connection groups. And these are set up and structured like small groups, like our missional communities, but they're set up to be a little bit less of a commitment. They, they meet anywhere from, from four weeks, five, six weeks. We have one that goes all the way up to nine weeks. And these are opportunities for you to step into a small group context, but you're saying, hey, listen, I, I'm not ready to commit to an entire school year of a small group, or, or I just can't. Some of you college students, it's hard for you with your schedule and things that are going on at school for you to do the full Year. And so these connection groups are great for you because you can just step in for a number of weeks and connect with a group of people. In fact, we will have um, two college groups starting in a, a couple of weeks when we start this Will of God series, the Decisions Decision series, and it'll be for college students. And um, uh, Will and Courtney Thrasher are hosting one. Kirsten Criswell is hosting another. Just an environment for you to go and talk about what you heard on Sunday morning with a group of your peers. 
Uh, Jeff and Debbie Glock, they're going to be hosting another one. Same thing, talking about this series, and that's going to be for anybody. And, and I, I know we're working to put a couple more of those kind of groups together. Just four weeks. Just, just get together with a, a smaller group of people. Later in the fall, there's going to be the Financial Peace University. It's a nine-week class. Just a, a phenomenal time to get together with a group of people and, and begin to look at the biblical perspective of your finances and how to be a good steward. It's a great opportunity. Women's studies are going to be happening at various times. There's going to be a prayer class coming up on Sunday mornings. Another group called Building Blocks, a group designed to help understand the basics of faith and spiritual disciplines. Great opportunities for you to take steps in community. And then finally, our 301, which is our community level. And these are our missional communities. These are the the year-long, school-long commitments to be in a group journeying together. And I know there's a couple of different um, groups that are forming. There's one men's study, Biblical Manhood, led by John Barrett, Thomas Boyd, Paul Henning. And they're going to be meeting um, every week for a year just, just for guys to get together and talk about. And this is a great opportunity for you to journey with some other men. Then we have um, some other just missional community. We have a post-grad group that's just unbelievable. They've just blown up and they've taken off. And these, these people who are just out of college, just stepping into their career, doing life together, they're just doing incredible things together. Then we have just other missional communities, a variety of family groups and mixed groups, and you've got singles and married couples. It's just a whole blend, and they meet on different nights and different times, and some meet every week and some meet every other week. And again, we have teams of people who work to help you get connected with a group that works for you. And the reality is if, if free will and choice weren't a thing and our elders were in charge of your lives and your schedules, um, I'd encourage you to find another church because that's weird. But um, let's just pretend that, that that scenario were true. What we would love, 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 love. What we would love for every single person to do this year would be to step into a 301 missional community. Knowing that's a huge step, knowing that's a hard step, but also believing that it is the best opportunity for you to be discipled in what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But again, we realize it's a huge step. And if you're not ready for that, that's okay. But please, this next month as we dive into our our, uh, connection month, be ready and prepared to take a step in community. Whether it's a 101, a 201, or a 301, take a step, a courageous step forward. And as you take steps in the journey, and it won't always be easy, and, and we know that there's, there's, sometimes it's hard to connect and get schedules right and, and people right. We know that, but we're going to work with you, and we believe that you will find the effort to be incredibly worthwhile. Galatians 6.2 says, carry each other's burdens. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. When you find yourself in a circle, this is just one of the beautiful things that can begin to happen. And again, this is the best way for this to happen. In a church our size, unfortunately, this this happens where people are going through hardships and burdens. And because of our size and because of some of the anonymity that we cling on to, sometimes those things are missed. I'm telling you, there is... Few things more painful and discouraging as a pastor to learn when one of our people has been hurting and has been missed. And one of the first things that that we ask when we find out about a story or something happening in someone's life is, are they in a missional community? Who are they with? Have we contacted their group? Because what we know is these people that you are doing life with and you're in a circle with and you have have this relationship of eyeball to eyeball and, and sharing life with each other, these are the best people to be in the trenches with you so that you are not missed. A little while back, um, we were going through a little bit of a, a difficult time as a family, a circumstance that, that we were kind of journeying through and uh, we were here on a, on a Sunday and church let out and um, you know, Erica was doing the drill of getting all the kids and trying to get out to the car and, and take off. And um, one of the people from our circle saw her and just kind of sensed that something was off and just sort of cornered her really quick and said, hey, are you okay? What's going on? And Erica teared up and she said, I'm sorry, I, I got to go. And she just slipped out. I mean, these crazy people, they, they got in their car and they followed Erica home. And Erica gets in the driveway and, like, lets the kids out. And these people pull in. 
and they open the doors and they tell our kids like, hey, get in the car. And our kids are like, yeah, awesome. And they get in the car and um, stranger danger. No, but it's like, <laughs> they, just, they just get in the car and, and they turn to Erica and they say, hey, listen, we've got the kids. Um, we'll bring them back after dinner. You, you and Matt take the day. And so I, you know, finish up my, my work here and I come home and I find Erica just sitting in the driveway and, you know, like tears in her eyes and I'm like, what is going on? Like, where's our kids? And so, um, <laughs> so she tells me what had happened and um, it's just this unbelievable moment of this burden and this thing we were going through just, just being lifted and getting a little lighter. And so we, we did... Gosh, what every couple should do when they're going through something and they find a little space. We went to a Mexican restaurant and ordered some cheese dip and just sat at a table and like cried for like an hour, seriously. And then we just processed and it was awesome. And it was amazing. And and it created space and room for us to to talk and to pray and to make some decisions on some things. And that happened because we were in a circle and we had people who had their radar up for what was going on and people who were willing to ask the hard question and to, to press in. And see, that's what healthy communities do. How, how is the marriage? How is the relationship? What's going on with the kids? Are, are, are things financially going okay? And, um, you know, did, did he call you back? Or how did the, the test go? How, is there anything I can do to help you? And I know sitting here and hearing that just feels like... <gasps> That's what it means to encourage and to spur one another on towards love and good deeds. No, please don't follow my wife home and, and try to take my kids because that's <laughs> stalking and kidnapping. And um, it wouldn't be good. Um, another thing, two weeks ago, we got a, a phone call in the morning. It was just one of those calls. I mean, it was, it was just a doozy and it just set off this chain reaction of of events and things that we had to kind of quickly respond to and it it just frazzled us frazzled our nerves kind of started the day off rough and and I had an appointment two hours away and I had to get to it so I had to take off Erica had all the kids and and she's needing to go she has a class that she's teaching and and it's just sort of the frenzied moment she locks her keys in the car and she's stuck and I'm gone and again some people from our circle showed up and they went and got car seats and they got kids where they needed to go and they helped Erica get her class set up and get her situated and then they figured out a way to get the keys out of the car and by the time I showed up, they were like, hey, listen, um, we're gonna uh, go get dinner for you guys. What do you want? And by the way, we're not asking you, we're, we're telling you. We have some super pushy people in our circle. Um <laughs> I'd highly recommend it. It's a good thing. And it was amazing. And again, they, these people just opened up this space for us to process. And they came and they brought dinner and they sat with us and they just listened. And they let us vent and they let us air some things out. And see, when you take steps towards community, you open yourself up to be known and, and, and to know others and to have people stand in gaps for you. And you begin to stand in gaps for others. And this is so critically important and needed because it's part of who we are as people. It's who God designed us to be. As we're wrapping up, late last year, the the Harris Poll conducted a survey of of 2,000 Americans where they found that 72% of Americans experience loneliness on a regular basis. Over one-third of them experience it multiple times a week. And there are many other studies and research that show that that we live in one of the loneliest times of history. Our our devices and our digital profiles have created this false sense of community and a huge deficit in our real relationships. And it has actually pulled us further apart. And our digital personas project a much better image than our realities. And it causes us to fear, again, that behind-the-scenes look. And if we look at studies from 20 years ago, Suicide is up. Medication for depression is up. Drug addiction is up. And in our busyness, people are becoming less connected. And yet studies show that loneliness and absence of social connection actually trigger some of the same primal internal alarms as hunger and thirst. It's in our God-given DNA. 
John Cassiapo, uh, director of the University of Chicago Center of Cognitive and Social Neuroscience, reported this. One of the things we've learned from the studies over the last couple of decades is that loneliness puts your brain into self-preservation mode. From brain imaging studies, we also know the visual cortex becomes more active while the area in the brain responsible for empathy becomes less active. And this is where we see the danger of loneliness and what can happen in the lack of community and how God has actually designed and wired us to be leaning into this. In preparing for this message in this series, um, I, I titled this message a while ago, Community Life Matters. You know, this is the thing that pastors do. We, we try to come up with, you know, trendy, cool, catchy titles, things that are culturally relevant. And so I thought in the midst of the Lives Matters hashtags that we've seen over the last couple of years that this would make sense having no idea, obviously, that this Lives Matter issue would just fly back onto our radar in such a huge way in the past 48 hours. And once again, hatred and evil would impact our communities as we continue to struggle with our freedoms and our differences. And what has happened in Charlottesville is heartbreaking. Absolutely heartbreaking. And as we wrap up, I want to pause and I want to pray for those people and some of the people who woke up to a painful new reality this morning. But friends, as I watched the horror of this thing play out yesterday and and just saw some of the gruesome video footage and images that were coming across, and I listened to some of the statements and responses, I am convinced all the more how much we need each other. We need safe places to process life and to process heavy things because the adverse is Division will rise up. Violence will take place. That's what happens when there's not safety in community. And if you catch at the end of this this verse 25, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. The day approaching is talking about Christ returning and the end of the earthly story. And if you've been paying attention to the news over the last few weeks and couple of months, I think think you would agree that while we don't know what the exact day is, we, 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 are, we are probably most likely inching a bit closer. And so all the more reason that we should be leaning into community, all the more reason that we should be stepping out of rows courageously to get in circles, all the more reason that we should lean in to spur one another on to love and good deeds, all the more reason that we should accept one another as Christ accepted us, all the more reason that we should begin to carry one another's burdens because this is what the world needs. It needs to see the church operating in community. And this is the picture and and the hope that we can provide and this is a glimpse of a Savior with waiting with wide open acceptance that we can point to and glorify through the ways that we connect with each other. So my only ask for you is this. In a couple of weeks, we will open up these opportunities for you to commit to take a step towards community. Come ready with a decision of what that's going to look like for you. Because you know and I know that in two weeks, a lot of life is going to happen. And a lot of things are going to be put into the jar. Don't let this moment in this season pass you by and not leave room for a step towards community. A community that can change you, but can also change the trajectory of lives of the people around you. Let's pray. Father, thank you so very much for your love. Thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ that opens up acceptance for us as we are, but loves us as you are the perfect Father, loves us too much to leave us there. Thank you for that. And Father, may we model that in our lives in the ways that we pursue community with each other. And Lord, I do pause to lift up the community of Charlottesville and the people involved in the horrible things that we've seen play out these last couple of days. 
Jesus, I beg you to pour out your grace and peace over that community and over the lives affected and show up in the ways that only you can show up. And Father, I pray that there would be communities of people there that would spur one another on to love and good deeds, that would rise up above the hate, that would rise up above the evil and would show the world around them this picture of hope and this picture of love. God, we need that. Lead us in that way in our communities, in our circles of influence, in our world, so that we may bring glory to your name. Christ's name, amen.